Jesus was a rock star. He brought the dead to life. Would you pray with me? Would you say, Jesus, help me to be what you want me to be? Do what you want me to do. Because people without you go to hell. church today. Now, but it's not just about the church church. What it's about is the Acts church. We're taking a run through the book of Acts over the next month or so. We'll see how long it, it takes us to get through the book of Acts. And I, I am asking God to make our church more like the church in the book of Acts and less like what we think about church, because I'm not sure that we got it right. I think that we're kind of missing out of some things. And, and, and as I've been praying, I, I've had this, I told you this last week too, I've had this song in my head, and, and I wrote it when I was in high school, and it, Lord, and it's a frustrating song. That's why I probably never became a real song, because it was just, it's, Lord, we've been praying, we've been trying, but something's not working. They're still dying. We need your power now. What we have is not enough. You're the only one that can lift us up. We need your power now. And, and that has been the cry of my heart. The Lord, some of us have been praying for family members. Some of we've been pushing in on this, on this city. And it's like, God, we really need you to show up because we've really demonstrated that we're not doing a good enough job. And so God, come and, and do what you do. Because in this new church, in the book of Acts, it was all about Jesus. And what is it with with this Jesus. Um, there's two people that we know their names who were crucified by the Romans. All right, one was Jesus. Does anybody uh, remember the other one? He's a real guy. It was, wasn't just a movie. Spartacus. Spartacus was, and he lived about 71 years before Christ, about 71 BC, and he led a huge uh, revolt of all the slaves and they almost won but Rome came in and and crushed them and then they, they scared Rome and so Rome did something Rome crucified everybody in the army along the road from where they fought all the way back and this is the old Spartacus video beautiful you ever see him crucified it so beautifully as Kirk Douglas or what's his name again anyway I think that's Kirk Douglas but that's that guy but <laughs> but we know who he, who he is. We know all about Spartacus because the Roman historians wrote a lot about him. And, and they spun it because they didn't want anybody to ever rebel against Rome again. And so we know a lot about Spartacus because the Romans, the Romans wrote about it. We don't have any Roman, well, we have a little bit. We know that Jesus existed. We know that Jesus was, was crucified. Uh, we know a lot of, of those kinds of things, but no Roman historian took on the life of Jesus, all right? Now, part of it, because Jerusalem was, was like the armpit of Rome. Nobody wanted anything to do with Jerusalem. The Jewish people had, you know, they would revolt, different things would happen, and nobody really wanted to, to deal with that. And so the Romans, they didn't write much about them. And Jewish historians didn't write much about Jesus. And so, but we know a lot about Jesus. And so a good historian asks questions, how do, how do movements happen? Why did this happen? How did we get Jesus 
beyond the first century. How is it that we know about Jesus? And secular historians have a lot of opinions on this. Some are good. Some are not so good. Because there's not much of a natural cause for this happening. Jesus wasn't rich. Uh, I, I, I took a, a, a course a little while ago. It was called The Other Side of History. And it was trying to find out what life was like for peasants. Because everything that's written about ancient times has to do with royalty. Because the peasants couldn't even read anyway. And nobody cared about them. And so all we know about are the rich people in history for the most part. But not Jesus. Jesus was, was a peasant. He was a carpenter. He wasn't a royal family. Yet we know all about us. How does this happen? There's not a lot of natural energy happening to make that happen. And, but what we do have is the explanation of eyewitnesses. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who all write a biography of Jesus' life. And they don't write about, they don't write it about hundreds of years later. Have you ever heard of the Gnostic Gospels? Maybe you've seen a book on the bookshelf at Barnes & Noble that said, the lost books of the Bible, okay, or something like that. Or maybe you've been witnessing to somebody. I've had this happen to me quite a few times. And they say, well, yeah, no, they took everything out of the Bible. I saw over here they have all these books that are not in the Bible. The reason why those aren't in the Bible is because they're not eyewitness accounts. They never saw Jesus. They were written hundreds of years after Christ. The Gospels were actually written by the disciples. They were actually written by eyewitness account. Most of those guys would die for it. That's one of the great arguments of why we believe in Jesus, because why else would they die? Would they give their lives? Not just one of them. One person maybe be crazy. Maybe two people fanatics, but all of them, except for John, give their lives and become martyrs. They tried to kill John, and it didn't work out well for them. You can go read about that. But they all became martyrs, and nobody would die for a lie. And they weren't all crazy, and they weren't all bizarre fanatics. It's hard to argue with a guy who saw it themselves, you know? It's like, no, you didn't. Well, yes, I did. <laughs> you can't tell me what I, what I know. You can't tell me what I saw. So they, they, they gave their lives and they give, gave their deaths. The church was built as a movement, not a building. That's what we looked at last week. That the church was not a building. There weren't any. And it survived the first century because something supernatural happened. And... People witnessed that supernatural thing, and they testified about it. They went, and they were an outwardly focused movement. Then as a few hundred years go by, we get buildings, we get organized, there's hierarchy, there's control, and that's what we unpacked last week. But it started in passion and love. Now, there is a natural tendency for churches, and this is what we're going to be kind of looking at today, in as time goes on, we get watered down. You can even see that in church history with different denominations. They start and they, are, and they start out of a revival. But then 100 years later, a generation dies off, and they didn't get to see that. And so it, it, it dies off, and they become inward grown. There's a gravitational pull in every church to look in. There's a gravitational pull in every church to, to begin to just kind of lay back and to become, want to say it with me? Spoiled brat, old fart Christians. <laughs> uh, some of you may, may have seen this. Uh, and there's churches that they, they look really selfish. And you go there and maybe you went there and nobody said hello to you. No, or maybe you're going through something and you go and you felt all alone. And just so you know, that can happen here too. I, I once had somebody, uh, this was a few years ago, and they said, oh yeah, I should come to your church. I go to my church and they're so judgmental and blah, 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 blah. And, they, and, I, and I knew their church. And I thought, well, and I, and so that was, I was, well, 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 you should come to our church. We're obviously better than that other church. And I didn't say that. Um, because I knew it would be just a matter of time until she experienced the same thing here. Um, but because we get so ingrown, and then we get mad and we go someplace else, and we get mad and we go someplace else, and at our church, we believe, we don't believe that the church exists for us. We are the church, and we exist for the world. Let me say that again. We don't believe that the church exists for us. This isn't a membership club with benefits. We, rather, we believe that we are the church, and we exist for 
the world. Maybe, you got, maybe your parents got divorced, and then it got really, really awkward in church. It's a terrible thing to watch happen in a church, and so they, they, people don't, didn't handle it right. Maybe you got to see a church split. That's church growth the wrong way. Right? A, a church split where they got, they got mad at each other. Maybe you've had it, you said to yourself, you, you know, I've got non-Christian friends that are way nicer than my Christian friends. They're there for me. And there's a lot of subcultures that, that that would be true. Our stories about the church and what it is and what it's become is very different than what uh, they experienced in the book of Acts. And the resurrection was the rallying point. Now, there's lots of different kinds of Christians, okay? But if you are here today and you believe that Jesus is God, he died on the cross, he rose from the dead, and it's in him, in him whom we put our faith and trust, you are my brother or sister today. We can disagree about a lot of other stuff, but that is the important thing. Nothing else should divide us. Those things I'll die for. Those things, you know, um, you, know you can believe a lot of stuff, and, 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 I, and I have strong opinions, but they're nowhere near as opinion. They're no, nowhere near as important as the fact that Jesus was resurrected. And that was the rallying cry of the early church. We need to stop worrying about all these little things and unify. We are a church for the unchurched at Rock Church. At the very beginning when we started this church, we could have done a bunch of things in a much churchier way. And, and in some ways it would have been easier to do some of those things in a churchier way. But we decided that we weren't going to do that. We decided that we would, um, that we would make a church that preached the truth, but made it as easy as possible for somebody that doesn't know Christ to come to church. And we've, a lot of you have, have come as a result of that, and, and it is, I'm so blessed. I love ministry now more than ever before uh, because I feel like I'm doing what's closest to Christ's heart. I really think that's, that's where his heart is. But we are not immune. We're not immune to getting turned inward. And you can know the direction that a church is headed by looking at its prayer, how a church prays, indicates whether it has strayed. How leaders pray indicate whether it has strayed. Now we are going to look at today the first prayer that is recorded in the New Test in the book of Acts. All right? We're going to look at what is what did they pray about. So if you're a Christian here today, um, you know, if you're not a Christian, you're off the hook and you'll you'll listen to me and you'll say, yeah, I knew those guys were a bunch of self-centered hypocrites. And, okay. Uh, but if you're here today, you're Christian, and, and I was to survey all of your prayers for the last three months, okay? And I, and I was to survey all those prayers. I, I can I, if you were to tell me what you prayed for, I can tell you a lot of what you prayed for, okay? Um, you prayed for safe travel, right? Okay. You you prayed for blessed food, all right? Uh, if you're a student, you probably prayed for a test. All right. Now, those prayers, they don't take a lot of faith. OK, they don't take a lot of faith. Safe travel. Well, you're probably going to get to grandma's house. OK. All right. Bless food. You know what we say? If we don't bless it, it turns to fat. That's what we always used to say at our house. You know, um, maybe maybe it takes a lot of faith to pray to do well on a test uh, for you. I don't know. I'd For me, Lord, if you help me here, I promise to study for the next one. That was my prayer. You ever deal with God? Never again. God, will I do this? Do you do you, do you say the now I lay me prayer with your kids? I, I want to if you do, there's nothing wrong with that. But I want to encourage you, don't teach your kids a ceremony. Teach your kids how to talk to God, okay? Besides, these, these, these poor kids, you know, I mean, we, we, we teach them not to even hear what they're praying. And can you imagine if they did hear what they prayed? Oh, now I lay me down to sleep, pray Lord my soul to keep, and if I die, die? Okay, maybe bad thing, kids are going to die. Your authenticity is always better than my eloquence when it comes to praying. And all of those things are good to pray for because God likes you and he likes it when your attention is looking at him. He likes it when you come to him with your needs, with your burdens, with your all of that. And so keep praying all of those things. I pray for those things with my kid too. Not the now I lay me. We don't do that one. But, but we, pray for, we pray for teachers. We pray for people that we know that are sick. We pray for uh, all of those things. But today, I hope when you walk out of here that you'll add something to your prayers. That when you're talking to God, that you'll, that you'll add something, and it's what the early church um, did. If God had answered your prayers in the last year, 
uh, most of you, mostly, you would be the one that would be the most blessed. If you're like me. If you're like how we tend to be. That we are the ones. And we need to keep on praying for those things and pushing through those things. But I think that Rock Church, you want to be a part of something bigger and better. God has a purpose and a plan for your life, and it won't happen. It, it, it won't happen if all of your prayers stay inward, or if your first inclination is, is to pray that way. Now, the story leading up to this. Last week, we talked about Peter preaching and 3,000 people coming to Christ, okay? 3, 000, and, and Peter and John, they, they, have that, they have this awesome revival, and then they leave, and they go towards the temple, and, they, and as they're walking to the, towards the temple, they see Frank. That's not in the scripture. I'm embellishing this a little bit. Frank is lame, and he can't walk. And he sees them coming by, and Frank yells out at him and says, alms, alms. And Peter walks up, and he says, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I... What passion you have, bless God. Yes, what I have I give to you. Rise up and walk. And Frank walks he stands up and he begins, and it's an incredible miracle. Now, Peter, he, he's such a ramrod, this Peter, and he just had a big success, and, and now the Holy Spirit is on him. And so, now, he preached on the, on the street last time. He's feeling a little more bold, so he head to the temple, okay? He heads to the temple, and, and he begins using all this inflammatory speech, like, like resurrection, and, 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 and you killed them. And he preaches, and 5,000 people get saved again. Okay, 5,000 people get saved right there again, right in the middle of Jerusalem. But he offends the leaders in the temple. And this is kind of understandable because he says things like, you crucified him. Well, Jerusalem's not that big of a place. There's not that many temples, okay? Those are the same guys. These are the guys who plotted and met the night that they went. They were there in the Garden of Gethsemane when they arrested Jesus. They were there for the trial. These guys were there, and now Peter is there. He's got thousands of people, and they... Oh, did I miss something? And they threatened to throw him in jail, and they throw him in jail. And the people are like, what's going to happen now? And Peter's preaching, and he preaches this. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no name given in heaven by which you may be saved. And so he's preaching this, and, he's, and Peter's being really abrupt. He's telling him, you crucified the Son of God. Jesus is the only way, the truth, the life, and the only way to get to heaven, which you get in trouble if you say that these days because you're, you're a bigot if you have the audacity to suggest that somebody else's religion won't work for them. I was talking to somebody this morning. He told me, I believe in every religion. And I, I didn't go too deep into that conversation because it gets kind of... But, but the thing is, is that Peter's preaching and he's saying all this and it was kind of awkward for the temple people because there's Frank. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were unschooled men. They were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man that had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. You know, it's hard to win an argument when the lame guy that everybody knew is standing right there. This guy who was standing up, he's preaching. All these people are enamored, and there stands Frank. Frank is like, dude, I, yesterday afternoon, I was not a stander. Today I am a stander. I am still standing. I apologize. That song started playing in my head when I saw that line. Um, and so the, he, he, and he's still standing. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. Why? Because they had an eyewitness account. They couldn't dismiss it. They couldn't push it away. They had an eyewitness account. You guys, he's like, 
we can't argue with you guys. So, I, I, you know, so they're looking at Peter and John, and we, okay, we see this guy, all these people, we're not going to argue with you, um, you know, but you've got to stop preaching this. You've got to stop preaching this. Um, and they say, well, we can't stop preaching about this. What are we supposed to do, obey you or, or God? And so they witnessed it, so they couldn't, they couldn't shrink back from it. So what prayer do they pray? So they get arrested, they get, they, and, they, and they, they get put in jail, and they get out of jail, and this is when, when all of this is happening. What prayer would you pray after being in jail? I'd be like, Lord, please protect me, okay? God, I, I don't want to go through that again. I'd be like, Lord, I pray for your protection. Um, Lord, uh, maybe there's like, Lord, maybe they could have gotten some new rules. I tell you what, you guys, let's, let, let's shape our language a little bit to be a little less offensive, Okay. Uh, let, let's not travel together. Let's stay apart a little bit. Let's get some bodyguards together. And Peter, um, Peter, you, could you could you tone down the rhetoric just a little bit? Maybe m- maybe instead of resurrection, you could say showed new vigor. You know, uh, maybe instead of you crucified him. You know, I just don't say that at all. It's only going to make them mad, okay? Uh, tone it down just a little bit. And John, I mean, dude, you're, you're the apostle of love. Maybe you could do a workshop on loving people because nobody can ever get mad at that, right? And, and, and no more of this no other name stuff by which to be saved but Jesus, okay? The Jewish people aren't going to like it. The pagan Zeus people aren't going to like it. I tell you what, Peter and John, what? how about we do that in our small groups, Okay, well, you know, when we do these public meetings, let's just keep it real kind of nice and make everybody happy and stuff. And then when they get in their small groups, then we'll tell them the truth that Jesus is the only way because it's too offensive to do it to do it publicly. (coughs) When they heard this, they raised their voices together and they prayed to God. So Peter and John there, they are. They're arrested. They hear what's going to happen. Persecution is coming. The, the first martyr hasn't even happened yet. They don't even know what's coming yet. Okay? What's about to come is an intense persecution where people are going to be killed. And they come and they pray their first prayer. And they say, Sovereign Lord, they said, You made the heavens and the earth, the earth and the sea and everything in them. God, you own all of this. Nothing, nothing happens without your say. So you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant our father David, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. God can use evil people to do awesome things. And that's what's happening. And so they're saying that God, you can, you're, you, you're in control. Even the crucifixion of their friend, they're saying, God, you are in control. And this is so great. Now, if it was you, if it was me, I'd be like, God, I pray you protect me. Lord, I pray that we have learned all the lessons. I've totally prayed this way. Lord, I pray that I learned all the lessons that I needed to, okay? That I don't have to go through more to learn something else. I, I pray that I can have wisdom instead of having, you know, give me wisdom instead of having to show me wisdom, okay? God, I, I just want to get it without having to go through the hard stuff. But here is how they pray for themselves. Now, Lord, They said who God was. They said, Lord, all of this is in your hand. Now, Lord, consider their threats, okay? And enable your servants to be safe. No. And enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Boldness? You're asking, you're, Peter's, don't give Peter more boldness. Are you nuts? Peter, don't you think Peter's bold enough, right? Man, the last thing I needed, somebody said, Scott, you need to pray for vision. I said, vision? I got vision all day. It's getting stuff done I got a problem with. Okay, Peter was, he, he had boldness, all right? He, Peter was a bold guy. and he, It isn't political incorrectness. Lord, Peter, isn't it inc- political incorrectness that got you into this mess in the first place? Aren't, aren't you kind of too bold already? Be glad that Peter didn't have a Twitter account. Just saying. Okay. Have you ever prayed for boldness? Have you ever said, God, let me be bold? You know how I find myself praying? And I pray this for you guys all the time. Lord, I pray that you give me supernatural tact. That's what I pray for. 
God, I pray you'd help me to say the right thing at the right time. And Lord, that you would you would help me. But I I get a little more uncomfortable when I start praying for boldness, because when I start praying for boldness, God might actually expect me to be bold, and I'm not sure I want to be bold. I want to be tactful and respected. I want people to see me and to think that he's got it together. What he just he's so eloquent in how he describes things. Is it right for present day Christians to want to be bold? It doesn't fit our culture. It doesn't fit what happens in the media. Now, Lord, consider their threats. And they begin to pray for the lost. We're praying for the lost in our city. I don't want to offend. I don't want to lose a friend or have them reject me. I don't want them to think that I'm I'm weird or different or judgmental. But Jesus is famous beyond the first century for two reasons. It was a first-person witness who was testifying to what they saw. That's why the Gospels are the Gospels, and the book of Thomas and all of those are not the Gospels and not part of the Bible because they never met Jesus. No, Matthew, Mark, they, they, they walked with him. They talked to him. They had first-hand witness, and they would die for that truth. They would never have died for a lie. They were first-person witnesses, but then they acted with boldness. They continued to pray, Lord, stretch out your hand and heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Do you ever ask for that? Man, God did this. I remember God got this in my head when I was a kid. Um, that if there is somebody at your work that has a headache, or if there is somebody who's going through somebody with a child, you know what I've never had offend somebody? Is to ask them if I could pray with them. If it was a private enough place, even when they were completely away from God, uh, and I say, can we pray for your daughter? Could I discreetly do that for you right here? And then pray for their kid right there. And number one, sometimes God answers those prayers. He's just so incredibly cool that way. But again, even if he doesn't, It's not my job to take care of God's reputation. What I've learned is, even if that prayer isn't answered in the way that we thought it, we wanted it to be answered, when I pray for that person, they feel loved and cared for. And I don't, I can't think of any time when they've said no. And I don't make a big deal out of it. I I don't want to embarrass them or anything. But I, I, but to out in the marketplace, and out in our jobs and on the street is where miracles are supposed to be done. In, uh, in the, today's church, we bring people in here and then try to do miracles. God wants you to see miracles happening out there. You see, miracles and healing is not for the person being healed. Okay, If you look in the scripture, people got healed as a sign to how good God was. Now, we still pray for healing because we don't want to hurt. And that's appropriate. Reality is, none of us is getting out of this life alive. And someday, somehow, you're going to hurt, okay? The purpose of healing in the scripture was to show God's glory to everybody. That it it was a sign. It was hard to argue with Peter and John when the guy who, when Frank was standing right there, and he was still standing, okay? It was hard. Lord, do something through me. Lord, do something through me. What would happen if our church began to add to their prayer, Lord, make me bold. Give me boldness. God, show me, Lord. After they prayed, the place where their meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of the Lord boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own but they shared everything they had. I want to share one more thing with you here today. And yesterday, I've been reading this devotional. It's Living Dead. And it's written by um, a missionary to Muslim countries. And actually, this Living Dead books, uh, the guy, uh, there was a missionary. And someday I'm going to share your story with him. But he died. And it's only after he died 
that revival began to break out in the village that he was in, and his family continues to minister to them now. And when I met some of these missionaries, I'm so privileged to be in the same club as them, but I'm like, dude, I, I don't do anything for Jesus compared to these guys. And I was reading in the devotional yesterday morning, and uh, this is what, what he said. If mission, in other words, missions and sending people out, in these last days falters, it will not be because missionaries are unwilling to die. It will be because senders are unwilling to commission them to suffer and die. In our world right now today, there are pastor colleagues of mine in other countries who are in jail. There are people who are giving their lives for Christ now. Like right now, today, people are losing their lives because they love Jesus. I heard a testimony last week of a person. They came to faith in another country. Uh, they were Muslim, and they could have renounced Jesus and while he, the guy is being tortured, he has a vision of Christ, and they, he rises up, and he says, and they, they ask him to renounce Jesus, and I forget the exact quote, but it was something like, if he's the one that I see now, and he died, and he saved me, I will never renounce him, and they killed him on the spot. That's happening today. There are times when I almost wish there was more persecution to get knock us out of our complacency. But the Lord planted you and me in Fargo. And the same God that lives there lives here. And God de deserves as much of my heart for our people as they do. So would you, what would happen if we began to pray, God, make me bold. Make me bold. Does our city deserve boldness? Do your friends and family deserve boldness? Or do you think this mamby-pamby, mediocre Christianity that we throw out there is enough? I don't think it is. But it only happens when we pray, God, make me bold. Because you are his hand. You're holding their miracle in your hand today. What if we pray, prayed, Lord, don't let my comfort rob me of my boldness. Don't let my comfort rob me of my bowls. We're going to be receiving the offering in just a moment. You can put all your prayer cards and everything in there. But as I pray this morning, I want to encourage you that when I pray for boldness, my prayer is, and what I prayed before we even had church, was that your heart would leave and you say, God, I want that. Now, maybe you're not even ready for boldness yet. Is there something in your life today that is not God honoring? Maybe you've turned your back on him completely, but more likely even, maybe there's a, just a chunk of your life, there's a piece of the pie that he doesn't own. It's a cute little sin that you're not quite ready to give up. It is, it, it's, a, it's a priority in your life that you know is taking away from what God would have you do in your life. If it is keeping you from the boldness that God wants you to walk in, I encourage you today to declare that thing sin for you in your life. Maybe the Bible doesn't, but if it is holding you back, what sin could be possibly worse than watering your life down in such a way that you are ineffective to bringing somebody to heaven forever? You say, Pastor, that's heavy. Guys, that's how high the stakes are. So I implore you today, if you've never given your life to Jesus, give it to him today. If you have, but there is some little pocket of your life that... that is broken, and it's not God-honoring. Let him have it today. Let him grab it today and take it from you. Lord, I thank you for the good things that you're doing in our church. God, I thank you that it, it really does feel right now, God, like we have an open heaven. And Lord, I thank you for that, Jesus. I ask God that you would make us bold. They prayed, Lord, let us be bold. And that's my prayer. God, I would rather be bold than be good. Lord, I'd rather be bold than tactful because I know that boldness wins. I know that something is better than nothing. And Lord, laying in my mediocrity is not working. God, we need to do more. We need to do better. And we need your help. We started out our conversation today. Jesus Help me. 
That's because, God, I, we cannot, we will not, there is no chance of anything good happening without your help. So, Lord, come and have your way. Come and have your way like only you can and make us bold. Lord, I pray that you would send your spirit. Lord, that you would fall on us, that we would learn how to get in a room alone with you, that you can change and mold our hearts. In Jesus' name, we love you, God. Amen. Jesus was a rock star.